Good morning. Welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Social Media Manager for HAR. I'm joined this morning by Dr. Ted C. Jones. Welcome, Ted. Honored to be here. Thank you very much. Thank Christina. you so much for being here. Um, so, Ted, if we could just start out, if you could just introduce yourself to our members. Oh, gosh. For uh, for 10 years, I was Chief Economist at the Real Estate Center from Texas A&M. Uh, left A&M in March 97. Since then, I've been Chief Economist for Stuart Title. Mm -hmm. um, we do business in uh, all, all 50 states and mm -hmm. up to 20 some countries a year, trade on the New York Stock Exchange. I served as chairman of the Houston Association of Realtors in 2004, won an honor. Yeah, and, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I literally spend every day looking at the economy and housing and commercial real estate and where we're going. Very good. And you mentioned to me earlier this morning that you have, on average, you've traveled every day this year? On average, <laughs> or at least flown on every flown day. Flown on yeah. every day this Some year. Some days are multiple flights. Uh, yeah, a lot, so a lot of days are two or three flights a day. So, yeah. Wow. Well, we are very excited to have you here this morning. Honored to be here. Thank in you this seat. Much. Oh, yeah. Not on a plane. <laughs> well, it's nice to be home in Houston. I, the plane starts up again Wednesday. So, there, yeah. we there we go. <laughs> so, uh, we heard from you in January at the HARYPN event. You gave us an economic forecast, which was very, very good. Um, now that we are through the first quarter, do you still think we're on pace for a good year? Not just a good year, a really great year. Um, you look at it, and we'll, we'll, we'll start at the top, kind of drill down, talk okay. about the national economy. I always say there's no such thing as the national economy or real estate market. Everything's local. Right. But if you aggregate everything local, we come to the national economy. Our job growth the latest 12 months, 1.71%. We added a little over 2.5 million net new jobs. So let me put that in perspective. Okay. Let's go back 40 years. And we know we had a major recession since then, we've, and we had the biggest boom time in the last 40 years that we've ever had in the United States of America. If you look at our compound annual job growth rate in that period, it, it literally was 1.43%. Mm -hmm. We're at 1.71% today, which means we're doing a lot better than we were doing at those point in times. Yeah. So things are really good right now. Now you say that, so let's talk about Houston. Uh, well, well, first of all, we'll talk about Texas, and okay. I'll just look over here. Texas in the latest 12 months job growth rate was 2.17%. We're the seventh best state in the country in 12 months job growth. And when you realize the U.S. is 1.71 and we're 2.17, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's literally almost a third better than the U.S. overall. Houston's job growth latest 12 months, 2.4%. Uh, I do expect that to moderate a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons we've had such very strong job growth tragically was Hurricane Harvey. Uh, you, you look at Harvey and, you know, one of the original estimates was just that month of Harvey alone, we lost 27 and a half thousand net new jobs. But after every major disaster such as this, you always have a boom. Yeah. You literally have people that even if they don't have insurance, they just have to go spend and replace certain things they lost. Mm -hmm. And we lost, you know, 200,000 homes and apartments damaged, and some completely destroyed during Hurricane Harvey. Then you have federal money that comes in billions and insurance money that comes in billions. So we've actually been living, you know, latest 12 months, probably a little above average, being driven by that excess coming in. I expect that to retract a little bit, but I still expect Houston to do better than the U.S. average. So overall, economy is doing great. And, and my one surprise, I thought rates were going to go up this year. And <laughs> we're looking at interest rates today less than they were a year ago, about yeah. a one-third of a percent less for the 30-year fixed rate loan. And, uh, and we have the Federal Reserve, our new Chairman Powell, Sitting here is talking about, um, you know, we're pulling off the table. Goldman Sachs came out this past week and said their estimate is if we were going to have rate rate hike, it's going to be uh, in the fourth quarter. And then I saw another uh, estimate from Wall Street saying they're probably not going to raise rates till after the election. Oh, <laughs> so you know, who knows? It, it is a political world we deal in without question. Sure. Yeah. So all good news, really. It sounds like. Is there are there any concerns that you have? You know, what, you know, one of the concerns is we are going to cool off a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a lot of political uncertainty in our country. Uh, we have a lot of global political uncertainty. We have mm -hmm. a, a global economy that's cooling, still growing, but a lower rate. Mm -hmm. But that's okay because we were growing above average. Mm -hmm. um, I think we always worry, you know, in this day and age, you always worry about things like terrorism. Uh, we've seen how it can just come out of the blue and strike us. And we are a... Uh, you know, here we are, the second largest port in the United States of America. We are the global supply center for oil field technology. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas Medical Center, probably the best medical center research group and treatment group in the world. Mm -hmm. um, just a phenomenal facility that we have in infrastructure. So also a target if you think about that. Yeah. Um, that said, I don't think that's going to happen. We, we you know, hope it doesn't. Uh, 
been very good at that thanks to our government and our, our people and our military and our other government workers that have really taken us to, to task on that type of thing and protect us. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that said, I'm actually pretty, uh, very positive right now about the economy in most places. It was intriguing. You know, we had the tax cuts and everyone said it wasn't going to help anyone and blah, blah, blah. Lo and behold, this morning, one of the articles came out that the average people, even in high tax states such as New York and California, actually ended up paying less taxes last year on average than they otherwise wow. would have. So the tax cuts not benefiting everyone, but certainly the majority of Americans. Mm -hmm. That's all positive. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But, but the you know, concerns we could have rising interest rates, don't see that at all right now. We could mm -hmm. have recession, don't see that at all. In fact, I have a blood pressure test if we're going to have recession. <laughs> you know, when you go to your doc, the first thing they do is they take your blood pressure. Sure. And it kind of gives you an overall indicator of your health. Mm -hmm. My blood pressure test for the U.S. economy is what is employment, and leisure, and hospitality? Mm -hmm. Not that that's the driver of the economy. It's certainly not. But when you and I feel good about the future, we spend money in leisure and hospitality. Mm -hmm. We take vacations and expensive dinners and we go to resorts and spas. We take cruise ships. Mm -hmm. We just ended up the best 12 months of cruise ship bookings the United States has ever seen. Wow. So that job That's growth exciting. rate right now is almost 2.6% right around that number. Mm -hmm. U.S. is 1.71%, which says we have really strong consumer confidence. Today. That's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Very good. We had uh, Patrick Jankowski with the Greater Houston Partnership a couple months ago, and he, he said similar, you know, that he doesn't see a recession anytime soon. But he said, but we have to stop saying there's going to be one because you see all these headlines that is a recession coming. Are we overdue for a recession? But, you know, from from what you're saying and what he's saying, that's not really the case. Uh, two things on this. First of all, we're very fortunate to have the Greater Houston Partnership. Mm -hmm. Talk about a great asset. And, and more important than that, there's a lot of these economic development groups that uh, they, they, they have this feel good attitude. I think th that uh, the Houston Greater Partnership is intellectually honest and I really admire that. <laughs> yeah. Again, I think we're fortunate to have that in town. Um, I think there are contingent of people politically on one side that would love to see a recession before the next election. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're trying to talk us into one. And, and that happens regardless of who's in power. Mm -hmm. And there's always other side that, you know, always wanting to get power, what have you. I just don't see what happening right now. Now, we know that, for example, 9-11 put us in a, a short term, not real deep recession. Right. So you have these events that are not necessarily predictable that can cause that. Mm -hmm. But right now, I just don't see one coming. We just don't see it. And again, you know, two years ago, they said, we'll have one in 2018. Last year, they said, we'll have in 2019. Now I would say, well, maybe 2020. And again, I'll go back to Goldman Sachs. They don't see one until at least 2021, unless mm -hmm. one of those unique events comes along. Sure. So right now, I think it's just study forward and uh, we're, we're going to have another good year under our belts. Good. Um, so if you have any questions for uh, Ted, please type them into the comments and we'll get to those questions in just a little bit. Uh, I do have some more questions oh, for you, it. though. <laughs> um, so we again, you spoke to our YPN earlier this year, and obviously they are millennials, which I feel like is a, one of those trigger words for some people. <laughs> uh, but what do you think about or what are you seeing when it comes to millennials with home buying and selling? So, so first of all, we're going to do a little bit of trivia right now, but, okay. but it's kind of important when we talk about millennials. Sure. I'm a boomer, mm -hmm. and the U.S. Census Bureau has defined baby boomers as those who were born from 1946 through 1964. By the way, it's the only group the Census Bureau has ever defined. <laughs> so we, we and by default, we know what seniors are. They're a, they were born before 1946. Mm -hmm. No one has ever defined what a millennial is, or Gen X, or Gen Z, or Gen Y or the whole works. Okay. So uh, on millennials, a lot of people are saying that NAR's numbers, I'll just use this one. Mm -hmm. NAR is picking right now. They're saying between the ages of 25 and 34. Okay. And uh, what's intriguing is, and, and these are great numbers, that that group only makes up 13.6% of the U.S. population. Mm -hmm. the latest 12 months, according to NAR, they're about 37% of all homes. But here's the gotcha. We always heard that millennials aren't going to buy homes. Right. They don't want to work hard. They're going to live with mom and dad. Ah, careful. <laughs> For the sixth year in a row last year, millennials were the number one home buying segment in the United States of America. Wow. Millennials are bought in the home buying deal. Mm -hmm. And it, it's intriguing. They have better savings than many of their Gen X and Gen Yers at the same age. Mm -hmm. They are committed to this. Where millennials are different, we call them dinks, dual income, no kids. Because most millennials, <laughs> they may not get married, at yeah. least now. But because they haven't had kids as young as many other 
previous generations, co population yeah. generations, mm -hmm. population cohorts, they got money in their pockets. Mm -hmm. And so we dual income, no kids. Now, on the other side, we, we call Gen X and Gen Ys, we call them sitcoms, single income, two children, depressing <laughs> mortgage. Gosh. So because they have children at a younger age, they don't have as much on housing. And yeah. that's one of the neat things that our millennials are doing. But remember, every time you see a study about a millennial, make sure you pay attention to what the age group is. Because yeah. when you talk baby boomers, we know what it is. When you talk millennials, eh, what do you define it as? Mm -hmm. So age group that makes That age range you mentioned seemed very small. But what I saw recently was 23 to 38. So, so, so it's even. So I actually, I actually define, I look at millennials as anyone born between 1980 and 2000. Mm -hmm. But notice we can all define what we want. But be right. sure <laughs> when you when you compare those numbers to previous mm -hmm. generations, you're comparing that same age group. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about even the younger generation, Gen Z, as they're they're calling it, right? Uh, what what are you what are you saying about oh, Gen Z? Great study that came out last week, uh, and again, it's it's being published today on this Monday. Uh, Bank of America they did mm -hmm. a big survey of Gen Zs, and and they're defining Gen Z as those between eighteen and twenty three. Mm -hmm. So it kind of fits with yeah. yours a little bit. Yeah. Uh, what they found out was that fifty nine percent of them, that's a big number because mm -hmm. it was a big survey too. 59% said their number one goal in the next five years is to buy a home. Wow. Over 50% are already saving for that home, Wow. which is amazing. <laughs> now, that said, uh, they're, they're going to need some assistance. And, and previous generations have had some assistance, too. 21% mm -hmm. uh, of those that survey said that they're going to look to their parents to help with the down payment and closing mm -hmm. costs. 17% are going to look at down payment assistance programs. And 15% are looking at other family members. That said, about a little over half we are going to look for assistance. The other half, we're just going to go out and save up and run with it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the nice things about it is home ownership is the best way to buy in your future. It still is said that for the average typical American household, the individual home is our largest share of net wealth and net worth. Uh, when you're young, you don't have any equity. As you grow older, like me, uh, you know, and many of us in my generation, we have no debts, what have you. It makes a big, big difference on that. So mm -hmm. it's a great way to accumulate wealth over the time. And remember that even today, uh, homes are still a great tax deduction to a point, not mm -hmm. as great as they were, but they're still still better than not only a home in most circumstances. Right. Oh, and, and lastly, look at the alternative. You got to live someplace. Uh, the average rent, according to Yardy Matrix last year, went up 3.2%. Wow. And... Uh, so you, you could increase that 3.2% or you could have had a steady state um, monthly principal mortgage interest payment, mm -hmm. taxes, insurance. And that would be very, very attractive without question. <laughs> well, I did my own mini study this morning. We don't have many Gen Z uh, people on staff, but I did ask the one that I know. And this one particular staff person said that they are saving for a home already. So, well, well the odds are that we're be. one for one here. They are, but 59% are. So, the odds are you know, we're saving 50 50. So, mm -hmm. you're right on the money there. That's, yeah. good. That's great. It's good news to hear. <laughs> All right. So, let's take a look at the questions that we may have coming in from our members. Um, so, a couple of people just telling you good morning. Great hearing from you. Always great hearing from you. Um, oh, remember, if you like hearing from me, you can read my tweets. I know we're yes. going to talk about that a couple of times. Uh -huh. Just uh, follow me on Twitter, DRTCJ, Dr. Ted C. Jones, DRTCJ. You can also read my blog and sign up our RSS feed, uh, blog.stuart.com slash Ted, blog.stuart.com slash Ted. I know we're going to talk about that multiple times. Yes. I'm going to self-promote here today, folks, <laughs> myself and Stuart Title. Yes, that's what, that's what we're here for. <laughs> um, okay, so Lois uh, did, say, did say, excuse me, uh, if you do a search for single family homes, both in 77055 and 77024 zip codes for the last 180 days, and you do solds, okay, hold on, <laughs> then withdrawn, terminated, expired, there were solds, 100, 186 solds, and 283 withdrawn, terminated, expired. Um, so she's throwing a lot of numbers at us, but she's basically saying, what would you say about the Houston housing market and how it's doing given, given these stats? So she's saying that um, in one particular zip code, for example, 77024, which is Memorial area, um, 186 sold, 283 withdrawn, terminated, expired in the last 180 days. Well, we're actually seeing a phenomenon right now uh, where, you know, literally five years ago, we talked about what percent of homes had offers over and above the original list price mm -hmm. with competitive bidding wars going on. Mm -hmm. We're seeing just the opposite where people have perhaps become a little over optimistic mm -hmm. in what their home is worth. 
it may, may have gone up, but maybe not to the extent that everyone thinks it went up. Mm -hmm. it, it's not going up the same rate it was a year ago. And in some markets, depending on where we're at, maybe a little bit of a decline. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're seeing that. I think uh, what that really says to me is you need that experienced realtor that knows that neighborhood, that knows the number of properties that have changed, uh, new on the market, dropped off the market, bidding wars, prices above asking value, uh, price cuts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think never has been a realtor's performance for their buyer and seller more important and more valuable than today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that we're in a bad market. You know, nationwide, we have a 3.9 month inventory of existing homes for sale. Mm -hmm. We think six months is normal. But we were used to saying, well, the last price is this, I'll, I'll sell it for more. That's not necessarily true today. Yeah. And it varies from location, from neighborhood to price range to specific product. One of the nice things we do have here at, at uh, Houston Association of Realtors we do have the number of months inventory mm -hmm. and you can drill down a map code, neighborhood, zip code, price range, the whole works. And it's a great tool to assist your buyer and seller. And what do I offer? Uh, what do I accept? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all that type thing in, in, in the negotiation process. So take a look at the number of months inventory on matrix. Yeah. It'd be a great tool for y'all to utilize. Definitely. Okay. Um, Parveen uh, is asking when you buy a house, how long do you have to wait before refinancing that home? Well, actually, it's not that you have to wait mm -hmm. before refinancing. It's what you're going to get differential in the interest rate. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, one of the and this is Black Knight that came out with this study, and it was just a couple of weeks ago. Our rates have dropped so much in the last three weeks that we almost double the number of people that would benefit from refinancing. We shot up from two million and change to four point nine million. The real key on this one is, first of all, you need to plan on being in your house at least three years. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to be there for three years, and our, our interest rate differentials today. Yeah, don't don't waste your time, your money. The, the other thing we have to look at on these differentials is what is your current rate and what's in the offered rate. Mm -hmm. Don't even think about it unless you can drop your current mortgage rate at least three fourths of one percent. Okay. Uh, I kind of like one percent drop, but people will benefit if they stay there long enough. And then the other questions come is what are your closing costs going to be? Uh, many of the lenders are throwing closing costs alone, means you might have a bigger loan. The other thing you have to worry about, too, is if you've been in your house for 20 years, they say we can reduce your monthly payment, but you're going to go to a 30 year mortgage. Mm -hmm. Be careful on that. But most lenders today will say, OK, we, we will offer you a 20 year loan today. So you still pay the same number of years, same mm -hmm. number of total payments, um, but maybe at a reduced rate. And you need to look at that. Compare apples to apples when we do that. Yeah. Oh, and one last thing. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about refinancing, very often our lenders today, particularly the, the, the big banks, that, that actually held your mortgage, a lot of them are going to say, you know what, uh, you come to me and I'll do you a deal because they like people who are great customers who've made their payments on a timely basis over time. Sure. So the first thing to do if you're thinking about refinancing is approach your current lender and say, what can you do for me? That's, that's a good, that's a good tip. <laughs> um, so Maria is saying, do you foresee Gen Zers <laughs> needing and using real estate agents? It's intriguing. One of the one of the studies again from last week noted that uh, Gen Zers and, and 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 millennials actually utilize the internet less in looking for a home mm -hmm. than that bona fide local real estate professional. Mm -hmm. So I actually expect my Gen Zers to rely more on experts mm -hmm. than perhaps people did in the past. Uh, so yeah, I, I think Gen Z people are going to be using realtors without question. And I think they already know the benefits of it. Now, we're talking about a group of people who live with the smartphone. Mm -hmm. And yet, they're not utilizing the internet as much to search for the home they're going to purchase. <laughs> so they do need that personal touch, that great local experience. And I mm -hmm. think it's where the local realtor has an edge that nobody else has. Mm -hmm. even, even as realtor, if I, if I was going to walk into a strange foreign market, I would, without question, Look for that that local realtor has that expert, that expert yeah. wisdom and knowledge because they are the local experts and that makes a big difference. Yeah, very good. Um, so they OK, so a little bit of discussion going on about the latest market update. Um, the Houston Chronicle came up with a low forecast for Houston as compared to the H.A.R. stats. Hard to discuss with sellers uh, to see the discrepancies. How do you think they, they should handle that? You know, I think the best way to look at it is right now, for example, in the, in the latest 12 months, the U.S., well, at the end of last year, U.S. housing sales were down 3% year over year. 
Houston was up 2.1%. Mm -hmm. Things are different here, folks. You have to realize that it's a local market that counts. There's no such thing as a national real estate market. That is true in Houston, Texas, too. Mm -hmm. We are doing well. We've had a strong growth economy. Um, look at our construction latest 12 months. Uh, we have 1.28 net new jobs per new dwelling permit issued. That's from apartments to mansions and everything in between. Condos, townhouses, mid-rise, high-rise, single-family dwellings, ranches, the whole works. And we think you need to be between one and a quarter, one and a half new jobs per new dwelling unit. We got 1.28. We're right in the middle of the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. We're currently not overbuilding. We're not underbuilding. It's great right now. I'm not worried about th this. And remember, every home's going to sell at the right price. Mm -hmm. uh, if your home isn't selling, you need to listen to your realtor. You need to declutter. You need to repair. You need to fix. You need to do landscaping. Those type things. Mm -hmm. And so go to your consummate professional and see what their thoughts are. I love to deal with people that live day in and day out just doing exactly that. I'm not one of those people. I'm one of those real estate guys that talks about it, but I really have a lot of faith in our local realtor. Okay, very good. Um, so Maria is asking um, advice for buyers. Should a buyer put down a lot of down payment if they have it or make a big payment after a while? Uh, my question addresses appraisals. Gosh, you know, I'm a reformed appraiser myself. You said I'm an appraisal company, the whole works. Um, very often, if you put down more, you'll get a more desirable rate. Mm -hmm. uh, the real question is, should you put down a little bit or a lot as a function of what are you going to do with the money if you don't put it there? Is your alternative investment going to be better or worse? Um, I'm one of the people that believes that uh, the quicker you pay off your home, the better off you are. Uh, that said, if, if I wouldn't put every one of my eggs in the basket of owning a home, I do believe that you're money ahead if you put at least 20% down. We know that, that you don't need mortgage insurance, mm -hmm. which can be an ongoing expense. Mm -hmm. So our, after that 20% thing, it, the, the critical decision factor is what else could I do with the money? Mm -hmm. uh, can I get a better return on it? And the return on your house is just not what the appreciation of the property is, but compared to renting. If you're going to rent something that's comparable, then are you better off renting or owning? Odds are you, it's probably cheaper to own than rent, mm -hmm. but it depends. It depends on where you're at in the country and, and the product and price range and everything else like that. So I would, I would tell you just look at your alternatives, but always put at least 20% down if you can. Okay. Um, Kim is asking, and we, we get this question a lot, and I don't know how much you know about these uh, comp, uh, different models that we have in the industry now i'm sure you do but um what do you think of the uh new uh what am i trying to say business models that we have um and how do you think they're going to impact the industry well let's look at this way i'm going to take us to another another industry i'm going to take us to the retail industry because because mm -hmm. selling homes and selling other stuff isn't all that much different but it is different mm -hmm. price ranges what have you we're going to go back and i'm just going to take you back 30 years ago Okay. What we had 30 years ago, we called it mono-channel marketing. You know, I'd walk into a store, they'd go in the store, shop, pick up something, take it to the front cash register, pay for it. That's mono-channel. And then we got what's called omni-channel. Now, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we're going to not just go to the store, but we can go online. Mm -hmm. And by the way, who we go online with, they may have a local presence, too. They may have, like my Home Depot, two miles from my house. They deliver stuff to me. I buy it online. They're only two miles from my house. So they <laughs> deliver it from the two mile away on the house. Mm -hmm. So so we're seeing this omni-channel marketing. Then, then we get into this other channel. I don't know if anyone this last holidays did a buy online pick up in store. Mm -hmm. I did that at my Walmart. Mm -hmm. It was kind of intriguing. I figured I would go in there to the front desk and pick up my stuff. Oh, no. You got to go all the way into the back and all the way along the back wall. You literally walk the, the, the depth and length width of the entire store. By the way, on the way back, everything they have on sales out in that aisle is I'm walking back there with my bag of sealed up stuff that is now sealed up so you can't shoplift or anything mm -hmm. naturally. I see all these people in front of me that are doing the same thing and they're now buying other stuff. Yeah. So this model channel market, now let's talk about the real estate business. We're seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, we've seen the same thing innovate over years. I can remember you know, literally 40, 50 years ago when Remax came out, it was a different business model. Mm -hmm. What? An agent's going to pay for a right to have a desk and a real estate brokerage company? Oh, that'll never work. Shoot. Most markets you go to, between, you know, Keller Williams was the same way. Going to deal with the commission structure differently. Mm -hmm. Most markets you go to today, those those two 
not always, but very often are battling out for number one or number two. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing the same thing in innovation in what level of services the consumer is willing to purchase to sell their home. Mm -hmm. You get the whole turnkey service where I don't even have to declutter, clean, or fix up my my landscaping or paint or carpets or anything else to the, I'm going to go with that super high commission, but I know that I'm going to get that custom service high mm -hmm. touch and I'll get the benefit from it. The neat thing is that we as consumers get to do that. Do I see that eroding the real estate brokerage business? Now I see it as giving the consumer the options they want. What's amazing is the consumers will tell you what they want, what they're willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about it. It's, it's intriguing. Uh, it's fun to see it evolve. But I've been seeing it evolve for over 50 years of my life, the residential brokerage business. I imagine it will for the next 50 years, too. <laughs> All righty. Um, let's see if we have anything else coming in. All right. Uh, Lois uh, was asking a question, and I'll just answer this one. She's asking about the Houston housing stats that HR puts out, um, if those are based on homes that are sold by realtors or sold by everyone. Uh, it's just anything in the MLS, Lois, is, is what that um, what that's going to cover. So um, I do have another question for you. Recently, you tweeted, and we gave your Twitter handle. We can give that again. Recently, you tweeted about the seven deadly sins of retirement planning. And you can go check out uh, Ted's Twitter to see what those seven deadly sins are if you want to cover any of them, you can. But I wanted to know if you would add to that list for realtors, if there is something else that specifically realtors should be doing for retirement planning. I do. I'm going to just real quick on these. By the way, these came from Market Watch, another neat service you can subscribe to that's free. Uh, first one was not saving enough or even saving any at all. Mm -hmm. And this is for general. This is non realtor. Now we're going to talk about realtors in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, draining your retirement savings. We had a lot of people that saved up for retirement and then came along and spent it all. <laughs> So I kind of, you know, we had money to retire. Now we don't have anything because we spent it all. It may have been an event, may have been, you know, mm -hmm. wedding, who knows what. Mm -hmm. but we did things differently. Uh, you need to also calculate a savings goal. You can need to estimate what is it going to cost me to live the lifestyle I want and how do I accumulate enough wealth to do that. And net cash flow on that one. Um, do not do not underestimate health care costs. The estimate is right now it's going to cost a little over a quarter million dollars for a couple retiring at the age of 65 for the rest of their life just for just for their health care, wow. four million dollars. Wow. Just forget all the Medicare, Medicaid, all this mm -hmm. other kind of stuff. This is what's going to be your additional out of pocket. Um, long term health care costs. You know, I, I had some in laws that uh, literally had to go to assisted care living and what have you before they passed away. And, uh, you know, the average in the US right now is eighty nine thousand dollars a year. You may think you can live at your home, but if you need long term care costs, you can't live at home. Mm -hmm. And eighty nine thousand dollars. Most people, you know, 10 years, that's almost a million dollars if you use gone through just mm -hmm. to exist. Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'll just retire when I'm 72. Well, what happens if the age of 65 you just can't work anymore? Mm -hmm. We call it mishandling retirement date. And then then lastly, we need to set our affairs in order. We need uh, we need wills. Mm -hmm. We need living wills. We need to figure out what's going on. I, I, the tragedy. We've seen people that were married. They didn't have a joint right of survivorship. Didn't have a will. One party was married before, had a daughter. Uh, daughter now owns 50% of their house after her dad dies. And, and, and the new wife of 30 some years is not happy about that, nor should they be. But the big issue with those of us in real estate, I'll call it the eighth deadly sin, <laughs> is that we put all our eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about a typical real estate agent or broker, broker owner, the whole works. You live, you invest, you work in, and you die or boom in real estate. Now, I've already seen three downturns in real estate in my lifetime when home values plunged. If I live long enough, I'll see a fourth one. Who knows what's going to cause it, but we'll see it. What goes around comes around. History may not rhyme, but it certainly does repeat, or just the opposite doesn't mean it. History may not repeat itself, but it certainly does rhyme. <laughs> so our big issue with those of us in real estate, we work in real estate. We invest in real estate. We even do property management in real estate. When the economy sours and real estate goes away, we just lost all of our wealth. Diversification is really key. Now, I'm not telling you that everyone needs to be in the stock market. You do need bonds, but you need something that's not real estate oriented in your investment portfolio. So that in the next real estate downturn, I still have some money to get through this one. It'll yeah. come back. I'm not worried about that. It's that downturn, that five year downturn. That's the tough part. Yeah, well, that's yeah. a great that's a great tip. Um, let's see if we have anything else before we wrap up. Um, whoops. So uh, Rubina just said the perception is that pricing is going down and buyers want to wait, even though you can give them CMAs and tell them that real estate is local. How do you address that perception? 
Well, I think you have to look at them and you say that, okay, so do you want to buy now? I always look at it like this. When's the best time to plant a tree? Three years ago was better than today, but today is better than three years from now. Mm -hmm. I think purchasing a home is much like, like planting a tree. The quicker you get it done, the better off you are. And so I, I'm, I'm going to use that analogy more than anything else. That said, uh, we are getting finally highly affordable rates once again. Not as good as they were a few years ago, but our rates a few years ago were abnormally low. <laughs> In my lifetime, I can remember 19% 30-year fixed rate loans. Wow. <laughs> the current sub-4% to me is phenomenal. Yeah, It's just really, really incredible. But, but, but it's just a great time to buy. We're seeing increased inventory, like I said, 3.9 months. We think six months is normal. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of markets that work completely seller's markets where the seller can dictate terms. Buyers can now pick and choose. There's some inventory to go from. And you don't feel compelled that I got to make that offer and up my price three times that day to get it. Mm -hmm. Nice thing is that one drops through. There's some others to pick from. So I think we just have to be realistic and honest about intellectually honest about our data. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Again, I'm going to reiterate, I don't know that we've ever had a better time that it's more important that you deal with that local realtor expert and that market that understands. Here's why those current listings haven't sold. Here's why this one sold so quickly. And, and I've already said this even as an appraiser. Mm -hmm. I think real estate agents and brokers know more about market values than appraisers do because they see the motives of the individual buyers and sellers. Mm -hmm. And it's that's where the cutting edge is done on that. Yeah. So again, find that that real good specialist in your market that makes transactions happen, whether it's for buyers and sellers, and seek them out as a person who represents you. Very good. Um, so uh, Maria, she had asked the question about addressing appraisals. Uh, if someone puts down a big chunk of the and the appraisal come, I'm sorry, puts down a big chunk and the appraisal comes in lower than the offer price. Um, because there's a break, big spread, the seller will not have to ne renegotiate the price. She, and then she said, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly. <laughs> I don't know if I'm reading it correctly. <laughs> well, it's true. I had one of my friends. Uh, in fact, they, uh, they they put their house up on the market and uh, they, they sold mm -hmm. and it didn't appraise. Uh, but the people were more than willing because they put such a large down payment down. They, they still, buyer still only had a 50% loan to value ratio mm -hmm. and the buyer still wanted that. Yeah. So that larger down payment, there, there are reasons that all cash officers are you know, preferred <laughs> or, or large down payment offers are preferred to sure. that person that's on the margin mm -hmm. because you have more flexibility in actually getting that transaction closed. Great. All right. Well, that looks like um, there's a couple of people asking about their specific areas, the woodlands and Pearland. I don't know if you have data drilled down that low, yeah. or that local at least. Yeah, I do a couple times a year. I'll tell you what, I will uh, uh, write a blog on that. And okay. we'll get it out to y'all. Where we'll talk about. I always like to talk about the, the four and four primary counties of Houston: yeah, that uh, Montgomery be County, uh, Fort Bend, um, of course Harris County, Galveston County. Our four primary. And then we have a lot of others. Don't get me wrong. I'm not mm -hmm. belittling you if you're in one of those other markets, but uh, about four times you actually break those out and down and break it out by price range. And we'll take a look at that. Well, that's good. I'm sure they'll appreciate Super. that. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Ted. Is there anything else that you want to? add or share with our members? Oh, I just think it's a great time to be in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, job growth far above normal. Even the U.S., like I say, 40-year average, 1.43% compound annually, 1.71% right now. A great time to be in Texas. What a great time to be in real estate. It's always a great time to be in Texas. It oh, it is. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, thank you so much. Again. Honored to be here again. Thank you. All right. So next Monday, uh, we will be joined by uh, Belinda Everett. She is uh, with the local Houston NAACP. She actually teaches a first time home buyers course. Um, and she is going to be talking to us all about programs that they have for first time home buyers. So we'll see you back next Monday at 9 a.m. Have a great week. Bye bye.